Hello and a very warm welcome to a brand new edition of To The Point with me, Frank Pereira. On the show today, I have with me a veteran journalist who is now a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C. He has been the executive editor of the Times of India in the past and served in the World Bank in Washington, D.C. as a senior consultant. I'd like to welcome on the show today, Mr. Gautam Adhikari. Mr. Radhikari, thank right. you for joining us at the program. Thank you. You know, you've reported on Indian politics for several years. You've looked at it from here in India and now you're in the United States. How do you perceive what has happened in India over the last 10 months? Well, there's been quite a change in the overall, uh, what should I say, the overall political landscape. For one, the Congress party seems to have imploded. Hmm. Um, and much of the uh, vote that was with the Congress seems to have swung towards other parties. Hmm. In the general elections, of course, the BJP, which has actually remarkably got uh, uh, an absolute majority in parliament, which is not the case. So that, which is not the case, has not been the case for a long time mm -hmm. with many uh, governments that were here in Delhi. But more significant, I think, is also the recent Delhi elections where actually there was a swing against the BJP. Of course, again, uh, I, I guess the Delhi AAP party, actually the, the AAP party which won in Delhi, actually got about um, I don't know, 55 percent or something, of the four, point something which yes. is extraordinary because in almost, I don't know any election in India, general or state, where any single party has got that level of support. I'm not even talking about the seats. Hmm. So that is very interesting because that was against, again, against both the Congress and the BJP. So what does that signify really? Because, so you know, the BJP did extremely well in 2014, yeah. but in 2015, the tables turned completely. So what does that signify? I think it signifies A, that no party really at this point of time enjoys national support and can identify with a national identity mm. because India is a very diverse country. Inevitably, it's politically diverse as well. Mm. So that diversity is now reflected. If you look at India uh, from space, let's say, mm. you find a blotch everywhere of various kinds of political parties and regional parties, national parties, all vying for um, a, a toehold in the national scene. Mm. And in the states, actually, you don't have that. You have uh, a, a different kind of uh, picture. But this combination is what makes India uh, a unique republic, a unique entity in the world mm. that I don't think there's any other democracy comparable, not even the U.S., which has this amount of diversity mm. and this amount of uh, ethnic, linguistic and regional difference as India has. Okay. And that is now being reflected in the political process. Mm. That would be the first point. The second point I would argue, I mean, and this is all speculation, is that this, is, this has got a lot to do with impatience mm. in a section of the population that is rapidly growing. I think it's 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 a uh, it's easy to call it middle class mm. but there are sections of the middle class but i'm talking essentially of the younger people who are both in the middle class as well as perhaps the lower middle class who are unwilling to wait as many of us old mm. geezers mm. have waited for mm. decades for mm. india to really be a successful democracy and a successful nation economically and they are waiting for opportunities. And the poorer people, of course, they need jobs. So patience is running out. Immediate results is what they are looking for. Is that one thing that, you know, uh, you believe that the BJP lost out on? Because in 2014, the BJP came to par with, uh, with you know, with majority. And also they made several promises. They made uh, uh, their agenda, of course, was that they're going to bring about vast change in the country and the people did not really see that in the last nine months and that's why they voted against the BJP, do you think? That is, is one of the factors, uh, mm. uh, if you look at it purely from the economic angle. That is one of the factors. After all, the BJP itself in the national elections got about 31% of the vote. I mean, with its coalition partners, it got 39%. Mm. So there is a huge section of the population which was in any case not supporting the BJP even the, it, during the general elections. But the impatience factor played a major role in the sense that people can't keep on waiting. Mm. And to be fair to the BJP, it's been too early mm. Mm. to, uh, you know, 
uh, say that the BJP has not delivered um, or the Modi government has not delivered, it remains, it, it should give them a little time, two or three years. But nevertheless, that is, uh, the, the perception is that it has not really moved mm. on a various, uh, on very various fronts. You know, as far as uh, the governments are concerned, I don't know if I can really call it the new government, but the Modi administration and the UPA government, you know, how is the West really perceiving the two governments? Is there a vast difference in the way the West perceives the Modi administration? Well, there was a lot of frustration in the international community, if I may call it that. Um, there is really no such international community. Every country has its own interests. But in economic terms, it's a globalized world. So there is a, co a, a kind of common interest amongst investors. Um, I would say that certainly the expectation levels were very high hmm. when Modi came into power. It was assumed that he would be in favor of a more open economy and a reformed economy. And this was contrasted sharply and ironically with the, the second Manmohan Singh government. Ironically, because Manmohan Singh was really the sort of architect in a way of reforms way back in 91. But the second UPA government, unlike the first, the mm. first UPA government was rather successful and mm. they, they, in fact, came, the Congress came back with more seats uh, than they did the, uh, in the 2004. Time, yes. In 2008, they had more seats. And uh, that second uh, five-year term was such a disappointment all around mm. that expectation levels were extremely high. But then uh, the first few months did not produce much action. And the problems of running a government from the center in a very diverse nation uh, became obvious when contrasted with running a state like Gujarat, you know, where Modi was successful. But then Gujaratis are uh, traditionally business people. They're mm. very, very entrepreneurship friendly. So it's very difficult to, um, in fact, be in Gujarat and uh, not be pro-business and pro-reform and pro-open uh, But then the performance at the central level is still, uh, the jury is still out. They're waiting to see what happens. Indeed. Even after the budget. Yes, yes, mm. indeed. That's what's going to happen, of course. But, uh, you know, talking about the economic uh, policies and talking about how India's economy is growing, the IMF and the World Bank have both said that India is going to be the fastest growing economy in 2016-17. That would be the third year of uh, uh, Narendra Modi's uh, government, you know. So, has the West already started adapting to it? Or how does it look at it, you know, as far as India's growth is concerned? Because everyone is pegging India to grow faster than even China. Well, that was the question uh, that was being asked by a lot. I mean, I got several calls from radio stations in the U.S. Mm. Uh, asking me to try and explain how this growth is going to actually cross that of China growth mm. rate. Um, there are some doubts over the rate of growth, how it's being calculated. I, I, I assume that you've heard of it, that there have been, there's been a lot of skepticism expressed yes. on the real rate of growth. And that is not a good thing. Hmm. In the sense that if people say that, look, we don't trust your statistics, we don't, don't trust your data anymore, that would be uh, to India's detriment and that would scare off a lot of investors. Hmm. But I think people are looking for stability in the government. And one thing that dis sort of uh, makes them a little apprehensive is not so much the economic side. Hmm. Though even there, I mean, how far the reforms would go remains to be seen. It's really the socio-cultural side where people are increasingly nervous that in this diverse country, there are folks who are close to the government or close to the ruling party who are asserting a very singular identity hmm. for the nation. And that is producing tension, that is producing a lot of, uh, what should I say, nervousness around the world. Even in the US, people are watching it and sort of being careful about what they say because they feel that there are things being said by the far uh, extremist groups who are hmm. supporting the government at, in a way and the prime minister had at, t till recently not really come out with thing. he did come out with some statements saying that we should realize that all religions have um, the right to exist in India but still that tension that is being created uh, is also affecting India's overall image 
and the prospects of inward investment because people sometimes feel that that might lead to a lack of stability. You know, uh, the Western media has been very critical about uh, Prime Minister Modi's role in the 2002 Gujarat riots. Do you believe that the Western world has moved beyond that or does that still stand as far as uh, Prime Minister Modi is concerned? Do they still judge him by that? Yeah, my problem is that since I live uh, in one of the Western countries for most of my time, I do come here, but, uh, is that I don't recognize a concept called Western media mm. in the sense that I see various media outlets and they have all different views. Mm. There are some uh, who are extremely critical uh, of the Modi record. For instance, the New York Times mm. is extremely mm. critical and it has been saying so, while at the same time welcoming the opportunity that uh, any new Prime Minister in India has to reform the structure. Mm. Um, other papers, like say for instance the Wall Street Journal, uh, would not really care that much about mm. what happened mm. way back then. And they are close to the investment community. So if you look at it from that angle, it's different. Television, and this is where I got to uh, point out that television and for that matter, even the social media don't cover India that much. Mm, mm, mm. Even the visit of President Barack Obama to Delhi was covered sort of wall to wall out here and there was nothing else almost going mm, on mm, mm. in television. You know, and that's something that I'd like to talk to you about, mm. you know, about uh, India's foreign policy and how the West really perceives uh, Narendra Modi's visit to the United States and several of those other factors. Right. But for the time being, of course, we'll slip into a short break. We'll continue talking to Mr. Gautam Adhikari on the other side. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back. In conversation with veteran journalist Gautam Adhikari right here on Rajasabha Television. You know, Mr. Adhikari, before the break, we spoke about uh, uh, the West's perception of uh, India's economy. Let's now talk about India's foreign policy and how the West perceives it really. You know, uh, over the last few months, we've seen that uh, the Indian government has taken quite an aggressive stand as far as foreign policy is concerned. There is a significant push from the Prime Minister himself, trying to reach out to its neighbours, trying to reach out to the US as well. But how does the West really look at India's foreign policy and how India is trying to be a dominant player in the region especially? First of all, India's foreign policy for a long time has not really had serious political leadership within the country. Mm. It was mostly directed by the South Bloc bureaucrats and foreign affairs was seen as too arcane a subject and be of little interest in a large democracy like this to the local voter, mm. except when it came to, say, Pakistan or Bangladesh or Sri Lanka. And Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and Pakistan played a role in um, public opinion out here on, mm. on various very different but related issues. So from that point of view, yes, I think there's a general perception that political leadership has come back mm. to the foreign policy. Mm. That the Prime Minister himself has been taking an interest in not only projecting India's image in a aggressive or positive, call it what you will, I don't know. I mean, that remains to be seen mm. how what emerges from it. But the Prime Minister himself is taking some kind of leadership in this. So that is one positive outcome. But on the other hand, people are not sure where exactly India stands and what India sees itself as its role hmm. in the world that is emerging. Within India, you hear a lot of talk about India being a future superpower, competing not only with China but with all the major countries of the world. India also wants a seat at the highest tables. Uh, it is a member of the G20 but it wants to get into the Security Council. But what will India do at the Security Council? Does it have a very clear vision of what it would do? Or, or, or is India going to 
by and large follow the hands off kind of approach towards wo world affairs mm. where it doesn't come to regional issues mm. india is very active when it comes to regional issues but as far as the rest of the world goes and i'm not talking about economic affairs mm. like trade and all is different that also is a problem area but uh, india is not really taking a major role in world affairs it, it in fact funnily enough it did at the height of non alignment mm. Mm. you know especially during the nehruvian years or even during indira gandhi's time indira gandhi did have control over foreign policy yes i mean i i really didn't support her for a variety of other reasons because i thought uh, her approach was too aggressive internally but in a matter of uh, in the matter of foreign policy she had a leadership role but what is happening now is that it's yet to be seen whether india moves away from the approach towards the world which was which can roughly be described as a very fuzzy kind of non alignment still mm. hands off uh, you know i am not really interested in those things uh, we are just interested in in what's going on in our neighborhood and you know we don't want to criticize anybody we don't want to uh, take sides in anything uh, that may be changing mm. may not be changing mm. but uh, india needs to perhaps come out with a strategic outlook uh, some kind of a paper i mean major countries which have you know which play a role in the world uh, you know as the world is developing today like the united states like uh, even britain or for that matter france they have a very uh, a road map yeah a road map on where they're going to go indeed uh, america comes out with a, a paper national strategic survey so yeah maybe that's something that we can look at and that's something that uh, it the would be helpful yes, it, it would, would be, helpful. be helpful you know let's move on and talk about uh, president obama now president obama has been stressing on the fact that india should play a more dominant role in the subcontinent and in the region <clears throat> what does obama mean by that does he want india to engage with china you know uh, uh, or play a much bigger role as far as afghanistan is concerned so what is it that uh, you know uh, the us and president obama really want of india if I think the fact that the US is sort of withdrawing from Afghanistan is one part of the thinking that is going on in the US on uh, US India relations and the way India's future role is perceived mm. out there. Mm. Um one fear is that with the US withdrawal the Taliban supported from across the border by the old forces of the ISI and sections of the Pakistani army will get back to the old kind of situation mm. and will destabilize Afghanistan once again now there uh, india india's role uh, would perhaps provide some kind of a balance but there is also the view that um, the present uh, government in afghanistan uh, is trying its best to mend fences with mm. both pakistan and developing a relationship with china so in that sense in this region itself india is going to be part of uh, four forces pakistan mm. afghanistan china and india which would hopefully provide this kind of balanced strategic atmosphere in future the second part of it is of course much larger mm. which is that while i don't think there is a clear desire to have india actually balance china in a sense that stand off with china not at all i don't think that approach is there but china's role in asia has been very dominant you know on on that point i'd like mm. to ask another question you know is the us really worried or concerned about an expansionist china and is trying to use india as a check maybe that's what i was trying to uh, get to that uh, i don't think it's just india japan is nervous about mm. it vietnam is nervous about it um i've spoken to people diplomats from singapore who are not totally easy about it mm. um australia has got a very good relationship with china but you know so while the old quadrilateral they thought is not being revived a sort of understanding seems to be emerging between japan australia china and the uh, sorry india and the us hmm. now whether that would make china unnecessarily anxious that it's being encircled 
by US partners, friends, some allies, like Australia and Japan are clearly allies, uh, is, is, is a issue that we have to keep in mind. And I think the US is also very conscious of that. That's why at the same time it's going on creating uh, the structure for a very understanding relationship with China. Hmm. Because whether China will be expansionist is not the uh, question. Because I think the expansion uh, form that, uh, that, say, for instance, put Putin hmm. from Russia has taken in a way. I don't know whether people really think that China would do something similar. It has done that in the past, but not, not, not any, any longer. But the, China, the Chinese uh, hegemony over the region is pretty uh, strong. And a lot of nations in East Asia uh, are anxious about it. And India can play a major role there in balancing that while developing an understanding with China, which the U.S. itself is trying to do. Because these are major powers. The whole world economy is interconnected. Indeed. So uh, the kind of standoffs that you had during the Cold War, I don't think that's the way to, do, to look at the future world. Mm -hmm. You know, let's talk about India and Pakistan now and how... Uh, the U.S. perceives the relationship between India and Pakistan. We all, we all know that uh, you know the United States has shared a cordial relationship with Pakistan for a while now. So, is the United States trying to you know trying to sort out the issues that uh, India and Pakistan really have as far as uh, Jammu and Kashmir is concerned? I don't think the United States is too hung up on Jammu and Kashmir anymore. Mm. I think it's uh, last decade or so of relations with Pakistan have sobered its view on how Pakistan operates and the fact that in Pakistan when it comes to security, strategic issues and foreign policy in general, it's not in the hands of the so-called uh, democratic government mm. which might be doing things in their region but uh, internally but uh, when it comes to external affairs it's the army and the ISI mm. which really call the shots. Secondly, they're fully aware that Whatever support it might give Pakistan, Pakistan always has an all-weather friend in China and Saudi Arabia. So these two can balance Pakistan's relationship with the US and the Pakistani establishment, the army establishment is playing it very well. Mm -hmm. So I think the US would like a, a warmer, friendlier relationship with India because there's a common interest mm. that Nobody in his, uh, no country in its senses, whether it's China, whether it's India, or whether it's the United States, wants an imploding, an imploding or even totally destabilized Pakistan. It is quite destabilized, but then uh, a, a Pakistan in chaos is a terrifying nightmare for sure. the whole world. And for these three powers, including China, which is concerned about some of the extremist uprisings, in the in its uh, uh, western provinces, so uh, it is here that the I think the goals of all three powers are gradually converging. Indeed. So when it comes to Pakistan, I think there would be much more understanding from now on mm. uh, than than there was in the past. You know, I said I would come back to it mm. earlier in the show. So mm. let's talk about that. Let's talk about social media and uh, how the media has been looking at the relationship between India and uh, the United States. You know. When uh, Prime Minister Modi visited uh, the United States mm. last year, we saw the Indian media going completely ballistic and crazy about it. And, you know, mm. uh, it, it, they made a big deal out of it. You know, what I want to know from you is, was there a same kind of response in the United States? How big of a news really was it in the United States? How many papers really covered the uh, whole entire episode? And what was the coverage like? Well, to give you a short answer, not much. Mm. Uh, in the sense that there was some coverage... Uh, there was a lot of amused coverage of Mr. Modi's suit. Mm. So, <laughs> you know, some of, the, uh, uh, some of the comedy shows actually featured that. And by the way, the comedy shows are not just to be laughed at. Mm. They're taken quite seriously by yes. the younger people. Yes. And, you know, they, they play a role subsequently in the Twitter world and in the social media in general. So there was a lot of uh, sniggering over, over that suit. Uh, but I'm just not saying the suit alone, but that, that kind of an approach hmm. didn't go down all that well. But yes, 
it, it was seen as significant that Obama was, was spending so much time in, uh, in India and that he had long sessions with the Indian Prime Minister, which were, which seemed to be, uh, at least it was shown on CNN, but not on the other channels very much, that uh, the two of them sat together and talked privately for a long time. And that sure. was seen as good. And in general, there is a positive attitude towards India, which maybe 10, 15 years ago was, uh, you know, uh, India, mm. you know, they're in a different world. We are not interested. In that. that attitude has changed. There are, there are reasons for it. One is, of course, India's uh, growing uh, economic status, though it's still not perhaps reached any critical mm. level mm. yet. Mm. But there's a huge Indian community. Uh, right. of, our people are Americans of Indian origin out there. And they are, uh, they number over 2 million, and they are concentrated in important areas like California, hmm. New Jersey, hmm. Florida, Chicago, and places like that. And they have the highest median um, income amongst families in the United States of all ethnic groups, including uh, white Americans, Jewish Americans, Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans, the Indians are doing very well. They're also seen, next point I would say, is they're also seen as highly educated and smart people. Sure. So that part of it is a factor. And there are Indians in key positions, hmm. um, uh, not just in the media, but in the corporate world. Sure. All so, right. All right, completely out of time on the program. Uh, we'll have to call it a wrap at that. Thank you so much, Mr. Gautam Adhikari, for joining us on the program and sharing your expert views on this particular subject. Much appreciate you joining, here, joining us here on the program. Thank you so much. Thank you. On that note, uh, it's a wrap on this edition of To The Point. Thank you so much for watching. See you again next week. Bye-bye.